Welcome to the Michigan Runner Show. Join us each time as we explore the people, the places, and the events that shape our great sport. Okay, hello everyone. This is Gary Morgan with the Michigan Runner. Well, I'm here in Portland at the World Indoor Championship. Well, they have a big venue set up here at Pioneer Square. A band is playing. We just had the opening press conference with uh, all, the, uh, all the leaders of it, with uh, Vin Lanana and uh, Max Siegel, USATF CEO, Ashton Eaton, and a few other athletes. But we're right here in Pioneer Square to celebrate this event for the weekend. Medal winners will be coming over here. And you can see it's all decked out with Portland 2016. And uh, we'll show you a few things and a few things around this city that's all going on here with the World Indoor Championships here in Portland, Oregon. I was really happy to, uh, to be able to jump uh, in that kind of competition just with uh, women and men pole vaults because um, First, we have a lot of space uh, to enjoy uh, for, for the competition, and um, it was a great show. So people, we know that uh, in, in Oregon, people love track and field, and uh, in that show, says show to us tonight that, um, that they really love it. Um, so yeah, it's a very great thing. And also, when you when you won, it's uh, it's uh, you know better than than if you do something bad. So. How does it feel coming off the disappointment you had in Beijing to, to get gold here? You know, uh, Beijing is uh, behind me and uh, I've been able to, to work a lot from, from this time. And uh, um, this, this um, winter was not really easy for me with my, with my hard beginning. I get some little trouble with my knee, a little injury, but uh, to be able to work on it and um, find what was the problem and just um, go ahead and then be able to um, jump three times six meter and at least um, at the last time in, in championship is really good and then also against uh, some very strong men um, so it's good championships is like that and uh, I'm happy to um, secure another medal uh, in, uh, in uh, another championships. What was the specific injury? Uh, I get some um, um, like it's how to describe, but uh, my knee was blocked, and then I have a lot of tension and uh, uh, like a tendinopathy uh, from the um, from all of these parts. So um, I still have a little bit of pain, but uh, I have to uh, now just have to, to get some some rest, and uh, and uh, we'll see with that. You know, before jumping here, you talked a lot with Fabiana. Can you talk <laughs> a little bit what, what kind of things have you talked to each other? Uh, we were talking about uh, about the competition, um, about the feeling she had because we are uh, really close since uh, since many years. So um, it was great to, to spend some good time with her and also because it's um, her last uh, indoor competition. So um, uh, I was happy that she came to my hometown for the All-Star Pairs jumping, uh, jumping with me and then jumping then and uh, we were talking about Rio and uh, all the preparation and what she she will do after after the Olympics. So it was a it was a good time for me because uh, it was um, the opportunity opportunity to uh, you know um, be relaxed and um, um, stay uh, stay in the competition and, and just um, take my time to to wait and and see the guys. No Laverlene, Reno Laverlene, Reno Laverine. French pole vaulter, world indoor champion. I would not say ecstatic, I would say overly ecstatic. <laughs> because my coach and I, Scott Kendricks, we have planned this out from the beginning of the season. And last year, we took a step away from my university and foregoed my senior eligibility in order to get some experience in the professional ranks. Thus, jumping in the Diamond Leagues, competing with Renault on a regular basis, these other great jumpers like Tiago and Jan Kudlicka, and my good friend Piotr Lisek, he, um, they all pushed me to greater heights. And that's something special when you come here and we all have to come here together. Yeah, I have a little advantage because it's home court, but I also have an advantage because they're all there with me. And we've been places before. How much of an advantage was it having jumped on this, uh, jumped here last week? I'll give you an analogy. If you climb to the top of a mountain, do you know what's on the other side? There were no maps before, 
then you yourself would have to see it. You cannot paint a picture unless you cross that mountain before. There's this huge barrier with this lack of a metal, this expectation of your country looking at you and having covered that mountain to see what it lies on the other side, to be here, to speak as a vulture that's come from the bottom ranks in America, that's very special. Very special to me. So this was a standalone event. Uh, the crowd was just focused on you guys. How did that change things? Or well, how did you, know, you feel about it? I, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of times in Europe, we have these standalone vault competitions, and there's music, and there's people, and there's everybody's having fun with the beer in the, in the stands, but they're all eyes on the pole vault. They may not know the most or the intricacies of the event, but they can learn to appreciate it. And that gives you a little bit of expectation when these people are, they came all the way here to watch you, to be impressed, to see something, to be inspired, you know, gain a little wisdom if they're even a vaulter, to find that little piece that helps them work out their jump in the future. That's really special when they can all stomp their feet and clap their hands because you know they're looking at you. You know, you've got a silver now and you've jumped 5'9", you think 6 meters is your next? You know, there are 19 men before me that have jumped 6 meters and two of them were in the competition today, Sean Barber and Renault. I find that to concrete yourself in history, as a pole vaulter, you need to jump six meters. But I will not rush myself towards that eventuality. 590 is something that I was so happy to jump the day. And uh, that was a product of great atmosphere and great competition here in Portland. And six meters is a process because the real estate gets very expensive up there around that 19 foot, eight inch mark. And you go at it a piece at a time. Now, I may not jump until I'm 25. I may jump in next week, but I'm not gonna rush myself. I'm not gonna get hurt. I want to continue to do my best to compete for the USA when the time comes. It seemed like you had a good connection with the fans. Did you feel like, as an athlete competing on home soil in the United States, you sort of had a duty to create that connection? You know, it's really cool when you look in their eyes and you know, if they say, go Sam, you can say, thank you so much, and they understand you. That's a little bit of an English barrier when you go other places. I don't really speak German, I don't speak French, I don't speak Portuguese. But when you come here, and those guys may have seen you, they may have jumped with you in the past, sitting in the stands, they may be somebody's parent, they may be your parent, somebody's watching on TV. These are all things that build, that build that heart rate. It just makes you so nervous. And if you can control that, you can use it. You can use it, a little bit of a drone, to get over the next bar. That's really special. Did you use it today? I did, and I had to. You could see, I had to take a I had to take a knee after my 580 jump because I had passed the previous bar. And my heart rate was just so high, my oxygen level was just so. I started to lose my vision. And I had to take a step back, realize that where I was, get my oxygen back, and go evaluate for the next jump. I didn't make the next bar, but I was ready. What was the strategy for passing that bar when you did? Well, it was a bold move, and I was kind of at odds with my coach at that point because he said, you know. I do not know if 75 will be the medal bar or 80. And it turned out 75 on a first attempt would have been a medal contender bar. But having not known that and going towards the 75 bar and having no misses beforehand, I was in prime, prime spot to take advantage of the situation. And that Renault passed 580, I was then ahead of him. So if I had missed 575, I would then be behind Renault because I knew he could probably make it on surf. He does that pretty regularly. So I jumped to 580 to be just ahead of him and hopefully put the pressure on him when the time came to 85 or to 90. But he did his usual or no thing, put me to shame, just playing. <laughs> what do you need to do now, from now up till Rio to, uh, to get back on the podium there? Well, the barrier for these huge events in the summer, USA indoor, uh, outdoor trials and the Olympic championships, is that they're a two-day event. You have a preliminary and then you have a final. Now I had the luxury here in Portland to jump last Friday and then have a full four and a half days, five days to rest and be my usual self. The trick is can you be your usual self the next day and the very next day after that. That's how you compete for these gold medals. What were you telling the kids when you were uh, watching Renault take those attempts? At the I said, shh, the guys are trying to get you on camera. And I was like, well, we, we, they were all shuffling forward because I put, my, I put my pole out there for them all to sign and they wanted me to sign their phones and their shirts. And then the guys kept rushing them back because they were on TV and they didn't need to be in that spot. I can't fault the TV cameras for that, but you know, everybody's trying to clamor for a little bit of a, a memory. And we were all, I had to kind of coach them into how to, how to help or know because it is not necessarily about jumping a world record, it's about being safe and attempting a world record. Because I know Renault, in his heart of hearts, knows that if one day he will be able to jump it again. But not if he breaks his leg today. And I was I was happy for him that he was able to come out unscathed.
Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the competition started out pretty rough. I I just got this new pole that I've been jumping on lately, and uh, we've decided that I have to get jumping on stiffer poles in practice because I get used to how this one pole feels in practice, and then I get to a competition, and it's hard to really connect with it and come off the top powerfully. So it, it took me a while to get in a rhythm there, and um, but I worked with my coach, and I just kept hammering it. And some of those bars were pretty friendly when I was hitting them on the way down, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, but I'm not discouraged at all. I mean, 485 on a day where I feel off, I mean, that feels awesome. Yeah, how often um, do you have anything like this where the bars are so friendly where you're scraping it over and over and still staying on? Is that pretty rare thing or is it? I mean, I think it was because I was hitting them on the way down. If you hit them on the way up, it pushes it off pretty easily, but it, when you're hitting them on the way down, they'll kind of push against the standards and wobble a little bit and stay on. Um, so, yeah, I was just coming up a bit shallow all day and it was just because I wasn't quite moving the pull through, you know, the energy wasn't quite there. And last weekend when I jumped 495, I mean, that wore me out. I was pretty sore the next day, pretty tired. When you when you have that much of an adrenaline rush and it's, you have that much adrenaline pumping through your blood for that many hours, I mean, you're out there for a couple hours. I was like exhausted. I mean, I'm just today starting to feel almost normal. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of myself. I can hold my head high and know that I went out there and gave it my all. And I won uh, a silver medal, medal at the World Championships. And it's, it's been awesome. This is your first pole season as a pro. And you just jumped in the greatest pole ball competition in history. What does that mean for you in your career this year? Yeah, um, you know, the women's pole vault has come so far. And it's just so cool to be part of this movement that's going on right now. Um, you know, we've got younger girls jumping really high. We've got girls, you know, coming out and, and jumping 16 feet. Um, you know, me, Gentry, and Demi Payne, we've all jumped, you know, Gentry, obviously, her world record, but me and Demi Payne are right up there around 16 feet each and every meet. And uh, it's just really awesome not only to have that many girls doing it, but that many of us being from the U.S. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if we go out and sweep the podium this summer at the, at the Olympics. Oh my gosh, it's phenomenal. Because, you know, usually when there's a whole track meet going on, uh, the cameras are on the races, they might cut to the pole vault and show one jump or something, but the, the audience doesn't quite understand the ins and outs of the pole vault. They don't appreciate um, the passing games you have to play. Like, oh, I'm in this place, so I have to pass the bar, and I have to make this on my first attempt. I have to PR to win this. They don't get those emotions because they only get to see one jump every once in a while. So to have tonight was amazing, and I think it's a huge stride for the pole vault just as a sport because people will start to learn and understand the event and how complicated it is. So, yeah, I mean, it was amazing. Sandy Morris, second in the pole vault. Sandy Morris.